Thank you. Thanks very much. So I've brought something to show you, and this is uh, this is a toy from my childhood. This is uh, my favourite toy from when I was a child. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a huge warm welcome to Tommy the Talking Tutor Robot. <laughs> now, that was a cheer of recognition. Did you have one of these? And uh, this, is, this is a fantastic toy. Let me explain how it works. There's some cards in the back here. You pull out a card. There's questions on the cards. Uh, you put the card into the front like that. And uh, so the, the question goes, where do they live? And Tommy will uh, ask you the question. So let me just see if I can... Where do they live? Did you hear that? Sort of? Yeah, OK. And then, so it's a multiple choice question. So it's a picture of some pigs there. Where do pigs live? Do they live in a, a cot, a spaceship, or a pigsty? Sp spaceship. <laughs> uh, you can try spaceship. Hold on a sec. Let me see. Okay, so uh, spaceship. <laughs> try again. It's quite sort of passive aggressive in that way. Uh, as, but but there you go. So it'll either say eh, try again or eh, you're right. So this is and this is how it works. And so the way you're supposed to play with it is that you work through all the cards and uh, you try and get all the answers right. Uh, that's how you're supposed to play with it. But the way I played with it, the game for me was figuring out how this thing works. How does it speak? That was the challenge for me because that was quite a unique thing back then, a, a speaking toy. And Today it's quite ubiquitous, a lot of toys speak, it's often quite hard to find a toy that doesn't speak or make a noise. Um, I was trying to buy a truck for my nephew and I wanted to get one that didn't make a sound, you know, for, for, for my sister, I thought it would be nice. And I thought I'd found one until we started playing with it and ever, whenever you pull the truck backwards, it speaks. And it says, attention, this vehicle is reversing. <laughs> and. Uh, and, and you can't switch it off, you know. I just, I assume it must have been a safety feature. And so I, I pulled it apart to try and make it stop. And I found that the voice uh, lived inside a microchip. And, and that is how the majority of modern toys make their sounds. It's via a, a, a small microchip, which is quite hard to understand. But this thing predates the microchip. So the way this talks must be very special indeed. And it's also something that as a kid you can understand. And eventually I just decided uh, as a kid, I'm, I'm gonna have to take this thing apart to figure out what's going on. Now, um, this is very precious to me, so I don't really want to take it apart again. But um, I can show you what's inside uh, this that I bought on eBay. So it's the same thing. Um, and so inside, inside here, look, it's, it's amazing. Let me just pull this apart. There's all these kind of uh, levers here and the levers are linked to um, the various the, the way that the holes are punched into the card and the notches and, and, the, and the buttons and stuff and they end up pressing down on uh, these six buttons here so there are six possible things that the robot can say and so this is the voice box this is where the magic is and inside here there is a tiny little vinyl record isn't that a beautiful thing so this voice box is like a gramophone. There's a needle that sits on the record and there are six tracks on here and the buttons choose which track. And then there's a cone attached to the needle and that's what vibrates and that's what plays the sound. It's entirely mechanical, except for the motor that, that spins the disc around. That's the only thing that the battery is needed for. And what I love about this toy is that it taught me something important as a child, which is that when you figure out how something works, you can make it do new things that you couldn't do before. So because I figured out how the levers work and how they relate to the holes in the card, I was able to make my own questions. So I cut out my own cards and like challenged my parents. And the questions weren't easy, like where do pigs live? They were hard questions like, where have I hidden your keys? Things like that. <laughs> And, uh, and because I'd worked out uh, about the spinning motor and everything, I figured out that if I rewire it, I can make the robot talk backwards. And uh, the, one of the things that the robot says when you play it backwards, it sounds to me at least like it's saying, medic, ah! <laughs> right? Followed by gunfire. Let me just see if I can get this to do that. Hold on. So I need to just wire it in backwards. Hold on. Okay. Go. 
<laughs> no, amazing. So yes, a, a very important toy for me because it showed me that when you figure out how something works, you unlock its potential. And this is what I was like. As a child, I was very curious about the world and that curiosity was encouraged at home. Um, but my experience at school was very different. And I want to talk about that. I want to talk about my experience at school. Um, but I do want to say that I'm not a teacher. Um, I'm a science presenter. And a science presenter is like the poor cousin of the science teacher, right? So if a science teacher is the person who kind of unpicks the complex thing and shows you the profound details of the thing, then I'm the person who just sort of points at the thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, look at the thing, <laughs> right? That's me, that's, that's what I do. Um, so I'm not a teacher and I'm not qualified to say this is what teaching should be, this is what teachers should do. So I'm not going to do that, but I am qualified to tell you about my experience of being taught. And uh, I can tell you about a handful of teachers who changed my life. And at school, and this is around sort of uh, junior school time. I, I really wasn't very good at school. Uh, I was bad at English because I was a slow reader and I was a, a bad speller. And I was bad at maths. Like my, I, I was really slow at my times tables and it was, and it was really hard. Uh, to give you an idea, we had uh, these uh, cards for learning spellings and on the cards there was a handful of words on each card and you'd learn the words and then you'd get tested on them and you'd work your way through all these cards and they were colour-coded according to the rainbow. So uh, red cards were the easiest and then orange were a bit harder, yellow was a bit harder, green was a bit harder and so on all the way to indigo and violet, those were the hardest ones. And everyone starts on red cards in the first year. And by the end of the first year, no one is on red anymore. Everyone's moved on, except for me. And I was on the red cards until the third year, until the, until the penultimate year. And we were doing so many tests in the third year that we just burnt through all those red cards. And they decided to put me on the orange cards. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd made it, right? <laughs> on a technicality, but I'd made it, I was there, right? Until I went into the fourth year. And in the fourth year, they decided, do you know what, we better just reset him onto the red cards, right? I just, I, I wasn't cut out for the lofty heights of orange cards. <laughs> so I was back onto the reds. And at this point, no one was ever on red cards by the fourth year. So often the, the cards weren't even there. They weren't in that part of the school. I had to go to the other part of the school to get the cards. I had to go to the first year class to get the cards. And imagine that, a fourth year going to the, the first year class. And there were kids in there who'd already burnt through the red cards. They were well onto everything else. And here's a fourth year coming down for the red cards. What an idiot! Who is this guy? You know, like kids can be very, very cruel, right? Red tard, they called me. Um, it's, uh, and, and so I felt thick, you know? And it's a horrible word, but, but that's how I felt. I felt thick. And so this was kind of uh, troubling for my parents. Like, on the one hand, they knew that I was very curious about things and always wanted to understand how the world worked and, you know, taking apart my dad's stereo and maybe not always putting it back together the way it should be and everything like that. And on the other hand, I wasn't doing very well at school. And it came to a head when uh, I asked my mum this question, and I don't remember this very well, but my mum remembers it very well because it's a very important moment. Um, I'd, I'd heard about this thing called relativity, and uh, I asked my mum for a book, and I said, I want this book by this guy called Albert Einstein, and the book's called Relativity. Can you get it for me? And, she was, and, and this was a kid who hated reading, and he was asking for a book, and, and it was like, what is wrong with my child, <laughs> you know? And fortunately, around that time as well, uh, the TV show Richard and Judy, This Morning with Richard and Judy, uh, they had a segment on a, a learning disorder and it seemed to fit very well with what I was like. And I remember this very well. She sat me down and she said, I think you might have dyslexia. And uh, she told me all about it and it was, it was actually really exciting to think that that was something I might have. 
and my parents approached the school, and I think that was quite a hard thing to do because it wasn't that well known then. But luckily for us, the head teacher at the time um, was an amazing woman called Mrs. Elton, uh, Joan Elton. And she took it upon herself to find out everything she could about dyslexia and to figure out the best way to educate me, to figure out how my brain worked and to give me the absolute best chance. And that whole process was uh, really enlightening. It was a really important thing for me because it also gave me a new perspective on my education. Like the reason I was bad at my times tables was because I was terrible at rote learning stuff. I didn't even realize that's what you were supposed to do. The thought of learning a list of things like that was so alien to me. I thought you were supposed to become really good at working out the answer quickly in your head. So I had all these tricks like uh, to multiply something by eight you just uh, double it three times. Or to multiply something by nine, you just multiply it by 10 and then take one of them away. Things like that. Even still, even with those tricks, I was still slower than everyone else around me. Because I didn't realize they were doing it from memory. I thought they were just amazing <laughs> at this thing that I was doing in my head. And I also figured out that actually I love maths because I loved finding those tricks. I loved finding those patterns and I loved solving those puzzles. So it was, it was very important. And um, this was in the fourth year, so the next year I was going to go into secondary school and it was always understood that I would go into the lower stream in secondary school. And Mrs. Elton felt that that wasn't right. So she took time out of her own lunch break. I think it was like half an hour every day of her lunch break for ages to tutor me one-on-one. -on -one. She found me these like special dictionaries to use and all this sort of stuff. And eventually she persuaded the secondary school to put me into the top stream, which was amazing for me. It was a bit of a nightmare for my English teachers, but it was amazing for me. And there was another teacher in secondary school, uh, Mr. Snook, Jean Snook, who showed me that actually mathematics is all about finding those patterns. It's all about solving these interesting puzzles. She showed me the beauty of mathematics. And another teacher, Mr. Parkinson, Jonathan Parkinson, did the same thing for science. He showed me the beauty of science. But I wouldn't have met Mrs. Snook, and I wouldn't have met Mr. Parkinson if it wasn't for Mrs. Elton. So if it wasn't for this handful of teachers, I could have gone through life thinking that science and maths were boring things, were dull subjects that were just about rote learning, about learning lists of things, an exercise in, in memorizing techniques or, or whatever it is. The, um, the Education Secretary, uh, Nikki Morgan, is a big fan of long division. And uh, she wants it to come back with a vengeance. And I don't know if you know this, but kids now, uh, long division isn't such a big deal anymore. They do something called chunking instead. And chunking is this amazing technique, which is a very intuitive way of doing division. And when you're doing chunking, it really gives you a sense of what division is as you're doing it. So it's, it's a fantastic technique. You can do it very quickly in your head uh, to get a rough answer, or you can do it on paper to get an exact answer. Long division, on the other hand, is, is kind of like a black box technique. So you put two numbers in, you turn the handle, and a number comes out. It's what we would call in mathematics an algorithm. It's a, a, a set series of steps that get you where you want to go. And don't get me wrong, I love a good algorithm. Right? I love finding algorithms. I love creating algorithms. Algorithms are fantastic. And actually, long division is a brilliant example of an algorithm. But you know what? I don't want to do algorithms. I don't want to be the guy turning the handle. I don't even want to practice turning the handle. Like, I enjoy learning about the handle and how the handle works, but I don't want to be the guy doing this. That's just, it's, it's, it's boring, you know? Like, if you're in the supermarket, you've got to work something out. If you're getting a pen and paper out and doing long division, what are you doing? Get your phone out. 
You've got a calculator, or even better, do the chunking in your head and work out the, pro the approximate answer very, very quickly. And you know, the great thing about algorithms, what makes algorithms cool is that if you can work out this mechanical thing, then you can teach a computer to do it. And if you can teach a computer to do it, then that frees up your mind for more interesting mathematical pursuits. And here's the thing, if you teach a computer to do long division, then you can put two numbers in, the computer will turn the handle for you, and you'll get the answer out. And at no point in that process, at no point has the computer understood the question, understood the answer, or understood the process in the middle. And the same goes for kids, if you're not very, very careful in how you do it. And this is what I'm really scared of. I'm scared that if you really hammer this stuff, if you hammer the long division, you hammer the memorizing your times tables, and then you say to the kids, this is maths, then you're teaching kids to hate maths. And that's very, very sad. Before Mrs. Alton took me under my wing, the assumption was that I probably wouldn't do A-levels, and I certainly wouldn't go to university. But because of her and because of a handful of teachers that were absolutely amazing, uh, I did, and I got a good degree from a good university, and my parents are very proud, and they're very grateful. And I'm also very grateful to that handful of teachers who took the time to figure out how I worked and unlocked my potential. Thank you very much.